Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for dropping in. I always appreciate it. I thought it's the perfect time for me to finally tell you my birth story. So if you guys don't know, I have a little bubba called Coda and I just thought I never got around to explaining my birth vlogs. I've got the first vlog that is a little bit shorter and mostly just my birth. And then I've got my extended vlog, which is a little bit more time after my birth in hospital um, and taking Coda Bear home and also just a little bit more behind the scenes for my birth and my labor at home. So feel free to go watch them if you'd like to watch them first or you can go watch them after. But hopefully this will fill in some of the gaps because there were times when I couldn't film or there were just things that were happening behind the scenes which weren't in my birth vlog. So I thought it would be a really great time to come and chat through my birth preferences. Um, we did hypnobirthing and loved it, so we'll chat through that a little bit as well. So hopefully this is entertaining for you guys and maybe a little bit educational and if you're pregnant or hoping to be pregnant soon or if you've got a baby yourself, hopefully this is something you can relate to or maybe it's going to help you on your journey. I'm not sure and everybody's story is so different. So. Even though this is my journey and my story and some of my birth preferences, please know that everybody's so different and what I wanted in my birth and what happened to my birth is gonna be really different than what everybody else wants and what everybody else ends up having. Everybody's births are so beautiful and so special and so different. Um, but yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy my birth story. So I'm gonna do my best to remember all the details that I can and I feel like in the first couple months after birth, everything's really raw and really clear. But as things have kind of gone on, I feel like some of the details are a little bit fuzzy and I definitely don't remember them as well as I used to. So I'm gonna do my best and remember everything. So the start of my birth vlog is my waters breaking and I was roughly at the end of my pregnancy, so 37 and four days. I sort of felt like, okay, baby will let me know when it's ready to come. So I should sort of be on alert, but I didn't stress myself out. I didn't worry about the due date too much. Um, I feel like if you put a clock on yourself, I feel like the stress is probably actually counterintuitive to going into labor. So I didn't really worry too much about that. In saying that though, I didn't really get to a point where I was feeling so uncomfortable or in so much pain that I desperately wanted to get that baby out. Um, I was actually feeling the best that I felt in my pregnancy because I had such bad HG at the start of my pregnancy. I've also got a vlog on that if you're interested. So I can definitely understand that once you're hitting your you know, 40 week mark, your due date, that may be wanting to get things hurrying along. And I just remember taking a step forward and just feeling something gush down my leg. And I had listened to heaps of podcasts of women's birth stories and I'd seen heaps of YouTube videos of birth stories. So I had a fair idea what that would feel like. But I also know that it can be confusing because sometimes with so much pressure on your bladder, it can actually just be wee. So I was thinking, you know, have I weed myself? Is that my waters? But I was pretty confident it was my waters because there was a lot of it. And as I walked, I was continuously leaking. So I was pretty confident that it was my waters. Um, so Coda Bear had been engaged. His head had been decently locked into my pelvis for quite a few weeks by then. Um, I think that was our last midwife appointment. She was like, okay, like you've really dropped. I already carried really low anyway, but she was really aware that Bubba was sort of getting ready for things and that it could sort of happen anytime from there. So I wasn't too surprised when my waters broke, but at the same time I was thinking, I didn't think that this was actually something that happened that often. I thought it was kind of like in movies and I was just expecting maybe some cramping or like a bloody show first. So for it to be that obvious and that quick, that, okay, you're going into labor tonight. I think that was a bit of a shock, but I was really happy. Um, Jay wasn't home at the time, so you'll see in the vlog that Jay comes home and I tell him that I'm in labor, which is really exciting. So for the next couple hours, we sort of just packed the hospital bag, made sure that we had our birth preferences on our phones and I had a folder with my birth preferences in it as well. And speaking about birth preferences, I will just clarify here. There's a little bit of to and fro on birth plans and birth preferences. And I definitely got the impression that you either are pro or against having a birth plan. Um, for me, I didn't want to have a plan as such where everything was sort of planned to the dot and to the T. And if it didn't go how you wanted, there's a really heavy sense of disappointment. 
I wanted a birth preference though where everything we'd been learning about and everything we'd educated ourselves on was in this preference folder or we had it on our phones as well. And so if something did happen, like a change of plan, there was always sort of something written down, especially for the midwives as well, as to what we would like to happen. So I'll go through my birth preferences with you in a minute, but in that were sort of notes like, okay, so if this emergency happens, here's how I would like for that to go. Emphasis on how I would like for things to go, because I feel like when you go into birth, when you go into pregnancy or birth and having a baby, Things can really come out of left field and I really wanted everybody in the room when I was giving birth to know that I was okay with that, but that there were certain things that I was not okay with without trying other things first. And if I didn't have that, I think my birth would have been a very, very different story. So I'll get into my birth preferences in a minute because they were really, really helpful for me and hopefully they can be helpful for somebody else. But I hope that this is encouraging for you guys that it's okay to have preferences in your pregnancy and in your birth and in your child rearing. It's okay to prefer to have some things done a certain way. I always urge other pregnant mamas who ask to go and learn as much as you can about your body, learn about why your body's doing what it does, why does it hurt, where's that pressure coming from? Um, and a lot of that is tied in with the hypnobirthing, which we did a online hypnobirthing course and we loved it. Some people um, call it calm birthing, anything along those lines. It's not airy fairy, it's so logical, it's science based, it's so helpful and we loved it. It was especially helpful for Jay because to be honest, I don't know too many guys or partners who are not the ones giving birth who really want to learn about these things in detail. So having something in front of you where you can pause it when you need to, or if you enjoy going into class and learning one-on-one. -on -one. We loved learning online because we could fit it in with our day and we're in lockdown so we didn't really have a choice. But that was so handy for us to be able to watch a few times and to pause it and to converse like while we've paused it. Um, and I feel like it prepared Jay so well. He loved learning about the science of like what was happening in my body. Um, and then as my labor progressed and then I gave birth, he knew what the doctors were talking about. You know, he knew what the midwives were talking about. He knew when I asked for something or I had a preference, what those terms were. And if you've given birth, um, especially in a hospital, you know, there's lots of terms. There's medical terms and they're just biological terms and there's terms for the different stages of pregnancy. Um, and it could be extremely overwhelming, I'm imagining, if you haven't heard that term before or you sort of haven't educated yourself, which unfortunately, you do often have to go away and educate yourself because unless you have a really thorough school class or somewhere along the line, maybe you're in a medical profession, you've learned that already. I feel like somebody like me who doesn't have those things and who wasn't told about these things and taught these things at school, I had to go away and actively learn those things and listen to other women's stories and educate myself on what my body was going to be doing. And not just that, but how I can get through it and how I can manage my pain. Um, and what to expect and what's okay and what's not okay and consent and all these really important things that played a massive part in my birth. So I've actually gone and grabbed the folder that I took to hospital with my birth references in it. I've also got them on my notes on my phone, but I'm filming on that. So I'll just read from this. Jay also had it on his phone and I also had this packet in the hospital bag just in case. I know it feels like overkill, but I just felt like if I got a little bit messy and some of it got a little bit soggy, then I had some, I guess I just wanted copies everywhere really. <laughs> so on the front of my birth preferences, I just have birth preferences. Then I've got my name and my phone number and then Jared's name and phone number. And I'm the mother and he's the father. So I just wanted that there for the midwives and they loved it. Like when I brought it in and I said to them, I know it's, you know, details and I know it's a lot. They loved it because I mean, I think my birth was somewhere between 11 and 13 hours, depending on where you start it. Um, I think 13 hours if you count my waters breaking at the start, um, and then maybe 11 hours of like active labor. I'm not sure, but it was a fairly quick birth because my contractions started pretty much as soon as my waters broke. So even though it feels like a really short time for us as the mums who are birthing and definitely for the partners because they have to hold the mum's hand, um, it's actually a long time for the midwives. They've got lots of time to 
read anything that you bring in. They've got lots of time to fill out paperwork and things like that. So for me, I felt like that gave them a really good idea of what I wanted in my birth, what I was aiming for, I should say. It also saved me a lot of time and energy having to chat them through every single preference that I had. They just knew as soon as they looked at this, okay, she's done hypnobirthing. Um, and then a lot of the time they'll have an idea that you might be going for maybe a slightly more natural birth, a little bit less intervention. Then on the back here, I had some birth mantras that I had researched and printed out. I didn't look at them too much once I got to hospital because I think I was around six centimeters dilated by then um, and well and truly on the way to having my baby. But what I did find really helpful was actually going and finding these and printing them out before my birth. So when I was in my birth and you know I had Jay by my side and I was giving birth, I already had these in the back of my mind. Whereas having them in front of me was great, but I didn't have time to read them. Like I wasn't going through them and like telling myself, you know, you and your baby are working together. I sort of was just trying to cope in the end and just get through. And a lot of the time my eyes were closed. So Jay loved these because he, again, like the midwives had a little bit more time and was a little bit more lucid than I was. Um, but like I said, before my birth, these were really helpful to get me in just a really calm, um, motivated, powerful mindset. So I would definitely say that they helped, but um, I didn't need them on the day. I labored at home for quite a while. Um, it would have definitely been, I'm guessing like three or four hours, um, which I ended up needing because we needed to put everything into our hospital bag. Um, and that takes longer than you think. Um, and just getting myself together, breathing through some of the early contractions, um, which I thought were hard, but I hate to be the bearer of bad news. They were such a breeze compared to later on, but they still took a little bit of um, energy and a little bit of um, time to just stop and get through them. I got my hair in a braid because I just wanted it out of my face and I knew if I had in a bun, I'll just be redoing my bun. And I also find sometimes buns can um, sort of give me a headache from the pulling and the pressure on my head. So. I always knew I wanted my hair in a braid. It's also quite long, so I just wanted it where I could just flick it out of the way. Um, I didn't want it down or like really in my face. So these were some of the things that I feel like I thought through really early on, which sounded really silly and a bit superficial, but I think they were really helpful on the day. So if they're things that are gonna help you get through on the day, then I think it's really clever to prepare for those things. So once I was ready and I was in the little outfit I'd chosen to give birth in, which included fluffy socks. If you haven't seen the birth vlog, then go watch it just for those socks. So we called the hospital when I felt like my contractions were getting to a point where I couldn't speak through them. I needed to be on the floor. We were timing them with an app, which I did find helpful. Um, but because my waters broke, which can really escalate um, and accelerate your labor, I did feel like things were happening quite quickly. And even though I was sort of saying to the midwives, you know, my waters are broken and you know, I'm doing okay and everything like that. I knew in my heart that my labor was probably gonna go quite quickly once it really ramped up. So I didn't wanna get sent home when I went in, which can happen if you go in you know, too early or they don't have space for you or they feel like you can labor at home. But at the same time in my head, I'm thinking, if you wake up and your contractions have sort of started but your waters haven't broken, I feel like maybe you have a little bit more time. But I just knew that my waters breaking was a really big sign that you know, baby was ready, baby was engaged, and there wasn't anything between Bubba's head and my, um, you know, my, my pelvis and my cervix anymore. It was just gonna shoot out. Sometimes they even break your waters as a form of induction because it sort of just gets things moving a little bit. And the effect it can end up having is your contractions being quite back to back quite quickly. Um, so knowing that was really important for me because I feel like I would have stayed at home too long if I didn't know in my gut that I needed to get to hospital once I couldn't talk through those contractions anymore. So long story not much shorter, we popped in a hospital and they gave me a little bit of a check. I didn't get a cervical check because I wanted to have a cervical check way down the line once we were established and once we were in the room and I was laboring. Um, I just felt like it was a little bit stressful and a little bit invasive when I first got there, but they did check to see if Bubba was engaged and they couldn't even find Bub's head, like he couldn't be moved, like he was on his way. Um, they tested my amniotic fluid because sometimes um, a baby can poo in you, especially in the later weeks, um, which is called meconium, and that's really dangerous as far as infection goes. Um, I think they give you, depends which hospital, but somewhere between like 36 and like 72 hours or something like that to 
um, pretty much go into labor naturally and then they'll sort of get you in and want to chat a little bit about induction because um, basically the feces inside you just floating around your amniotic fluid yet can lead to infection and it's not good for bub either to be um, well, breathing that in so that's where they want to get you sort of having the baby and getting that out um, but my amniotic waters were clear so I felt like they were a little bit orangey like they had a bit of a tinge to them but it de definitely didn't have any green or brown or black in it uh, which was really good to see so I didn't feel like I was on as much of a clock um, but in saying that I did want to take a little bit of time before I called the hospital and told them that my waters had broken um, which in the end they were really relaxed about they I think they could pick up that we had looked for meconium and um, that we sort of knew what we were doing a little bit. I don't want to say we knew what we were doing because no one knows what they're doing the first time um, and maybe not even the second time, but I feel like she could sense that we were keeping an eye on things. So um, I was continuously leaking amniotic fluid this whole time. I had a face washer sort of wrapped into like a pad style boat that I had put between my legs and my knickers. Um, I had two pairs of knickers on and I think like a bikini bottom as well um, and that was sort of just keeping things going. I also was wearing a pad um, on the way to hospital so that um, they could test the amniotic fluid when we got there which they did and it was amniotic fluid um, which was good because I was having really decent contractions by the time we got there so I did not want to be sent home um, and luckily the car ride wasn't too long. I think it ended up being seven or eight minutes because it was later, I think it was like 10 p.m. by then or something, um, which for me, I really loved because having no one on the roads and I felt like the hospital was, it was lit, but it was sort of dimly lit and it was quiet and there wasn't sort of visitors or the hustle and bustle that a hospital can have. For me, I felt like I could really relax, um, especially once we were settled in our room and we had some small lights going and things like that, but mostly it was dim and we were left alone a lot of the time. I don't know, I just felt really relaxed and that's something we learned in the hypnobirthing was giving birth is a little bit similar to going to the bathroom, which sounds really crass, but going to the toilet, you don't want a million people watching, you don't necessarily want to be on parade, um, you want to be in a, you know, dimly lit space, you want your privacy, um, you want to be able to relax, you want to be able to think about what you're doing. Um, it's a very private and intimate thing giving birth. And so for me, as a particularly introverted, anxious person, it was really, really nice for me to just concentrate without lots of people around. Um, I had my lovely midwife was just in the corner and she was, you know, asking a few questions and sometimes writing notes, but she would often leave the room and say, hey, call me if you need. Um, and it would just be Jay and I. And for me, being left to do what I need to do, which I know not everybody loves because maybe um, you, need, you feel like you want that support or for safety reasons you want that midwife there. But for me, I didn't feel like I needed it and I loved that she gave me that space to just labor in, in sort of my safe little birth cave and I really appreciated that. So after the check where they made sure it was amniotic fluid and that I was fully engaged and I was definitely having contractions, so she would put her hand on my tummy, the midwife would, and then she would watch the clock and just sort of count. Um, you can really feel the contractions because all the muscles are moving, which is amazing. Um, again, with, with hypnobirthing, you'll learn like some of the muscles are pushing down and some of them are, are sort of pushing in and like they're all doing their special thing to sort of move that baby down, which is just so amazing. Um, and as, at the same time, your cervix is a facing, so it's getting thinner and it's also dilating, so it's opening up, which is crazy. You need to get to like 10 centimeters dilated before your baby's head can come out. So yeah, I did get a cervical check when we first got in there, um, but I did get one maybe two hours later once we were settled in our room. Um, and I, I then had my TENS machine on, which I highly recommend. I really, really liked it. Um, the best way to explain it is um, it sort of stings when you aren't in pain, like I wouldn't wear it unless I needed to. Um, but then once you are in pain, you don't want to take it off. It's so comforting. So the mechanics behind the TENS machine and the biology of it 
They encourage your body to release um, serotonin and sort of natural painkillers, which distracts your body from the pain that you're in from labor. The only advice I'd give for a TENS machine is to try it out at home before you go to hospital or before you use it at home if you're having a home birth or you want to labor at home a little bit like I did. I didn't want to set it up and use it at home because I sort of just wanted to stay on the move and I sort of just wanted to get to hospital. Once I was at hospital though, and I was a little more stationary, and obviously the contractions were quite painful by then, I really enjoyed my TENS machine. Um, but yeah, I would definitely give it a go and work out the settings and put the batteries in and everything like that before you feel like baby might be on the way. Just because I felt like it took us, you know, quite a bit to set it up once we got there, and I found the settings could be a little bit complicated at times, and then Jay would go to press something while I was in the middle of a contraction, um, and sometimes it would change the setting or it would turn it off or something like that and I would scream to him like turn it back on turn it back on um, You just have this like Furious innate want for it to be on you like I put it on my back because that's where I feel like it's that sort of out of the way So I got my cervical check and they said I was at roughly eight centimeters and fully effaced which for me, it was really nice to know because I really started feeling the contractions. I started to feel a little bit defeated. I sort of started feeling like, okay, the novelty's worn off. And I started to feel kind of like, all right, I want to get an idea of how much longer I need to be doing this for. Which, looking back, is probably not the best way to be thinking about it because just because you're eight centimeters dilated doesn't mean the baby's about to come out straight away, which I learned the hard way. Um, and just because you're four centimeters or two centimeters or whatever it is when you go in there It really doesn't speak to how long you're going to be in labor for or when you're going to start pushing like Your body will do things as it needs to and sometimes that's so quick I've heard stories of women going from like two centimeters to eight centimeters to having their baby within half an hour um, And then I've heard of people sort of sitting at eight centimeters for a really long time and then Interventions need to happen because bub just couldn't quite get through that end or same with pushing so Until the baby's in your arms and your placenta's delivered and you're lying in bed You just don't know how long it's gonna take and that would be my advice for somebody who gets a cervical check is It's uncomfortable and it's quite invasive um, And so it's nice to know like how far along you are in your labor but at the same time, I feel like it can be really discouraging if it's not what you wanted to hear. So say you've been laboring for a long time and they tell you you're at a two or a four or a six or wherever it is, and you feel like you are further along, don't let that discourage you. Maybe you wanna move positions or try something different, but your body is doing its best and it's doing it at its own time. The reason I say that is because I was at eight centimeters and fully effaced and I thought that I was gonna be pushing within the next 15 minutes, you know? Um, but I continued to labor with quite painful, heavy contractions, sort of back to back for at least another two hours, I think. Um, so I was feeling quite defeated when that pushing feeling that people describe wasn't coming for me. I didn't feel like I needed to do a poo. I didn't feel any involuntary sensations of, oh, you know, I feel like I need to push. Um, I feel like if I would started pushing myself that it would be too early and I'd be straining, which I really wanted to avoid doing. Um, so yeah, I got pretty frustrated and I threw a little bit of a tantrum and um, I could feel myself getting so exacerbated. Um, and I was, you know, losing a bit of energy and the contractions were back to back. So I wasn't getting, I could barely get off the bed and then onto the floor if that's what I wanted before I had another one. And people weren't really asking me too many questions because I put that in my preferences that I wanted people to ask Jared questions first in case he knew the answer and I didn't want to be distracted. And then if there was something that they really needed to ask me, then they could. Um, and I did feel like we were getting to a point where there was just a bit of conversation about like moving positions or maybe trying to get in the shower. And I just could not think like, there was literally only like a, uh, like barely a minute between contractions. And I was obviously in a lot of pain and feeling quite stressed that things weren't progressing as quickly as I was hoping. So I threw a little bit of a tantrum and I said to Jared, like, this is stupid. Like, you know, I was swearing. <laughs> I was just saying like, this is dumb. Like, this is stupid. Like, why do people do this? Why do people go back for this again? Like, I really had this sort of dignified 
self-righteous moment where I just like went off and was just like ranting a little bit. Um, and I just kept saying to Jared, like, something needs to change. Like, something needs to change. Um, and he was suggesting, okay, I think you need to go and go stand in the shower maybe. You know, a little bit of um, water pressure on your back, um, get you standing up, just get you out of this mind fog. And I just resisted that for so long. I was in such a stubborn mindset at that point. I reckon I was maybe like nine centimeters or something by then and things were just not progressing. Um, I did opt for a second cervical check after those few hours, which I really regret now. I've always gone in saying I only wanted one. I just wanted the one to know like where I was at when I got there. Um, but I did opt for a second one because I thought I was not myself and I was just thinking like, this is stupid. I can't believe I'm still having these contractions. I can't do this forever. I'm like, how dumb is this system, you know? <laughs> like. Nobody quite knows like where you're at. You just gotta keep doing this until the baby comes out. So I did get that cervical check. Um, I felt like the midwife that did that, she was one of the head midwife there. I loved all my midwives. This one lady was a little bit um, assertive and a little bit pushy at times, which I did not appreciate. Um, but in hearing other people's birth stories um, in a hospital setting, I have heard of some I'll just say I've heard much worse than, than what happened to me. So if that's sort of the only thing that I would change, then um, I'm not complaining, you know. But she's pretty forward and she really wanted to um, sort of stay up in that cervical check for a long time. She wanted to wait for a contraction. Um, and I did not appreciate that because firstly, getting a cervical check is really painful and invasive for me anyway. I never had a stretch and sweep or anything, but I'm guessing it's just sort of the same lines like firstly they're like up in your vagina and then your cervix is quite high up so then they've got a feel so checking for dilation is all manual so midwives train with their hands and with their fingers to feel basically your vagina and your cervix and how far along you are so it's not a little measuring tool there's no precise way of telling you don't know if you've got a cervical lip it's all just sort of guesswork um, so this particular midwife, um, she really wanted to continue the cervical check to wait for a contraction. Um, and I was just in so much pain. Like it was so uncomfortable when your body's just screaming to move cause you're on your back for that as well, which in my opinion is a difficult position to labor in, um, sort of working against the muscles and, and gravity and the way that your body's trying to labor. You just want to close your legs, like nothing. It takes a lot of willpower to keep your legs open for something like that. So I said that I was done with the cervical check. Um, she felt like, she could feel a cervical lip, which is where part of your cervix is a little bit swollen or it's not dilating as quickly as the other side. So a cervical lip can be quite difficult in labor, especially if bub is pressing on it. It can sometimes just continue to swell um, and baby can't come through until you're fully dilated and effaced like we've talked about. So yeah, she really wanted to feel like this cervical lip. And I said I was done with the cervical check. It was too painful and I wanted her to stop. Um, but she did push a little bit further. She really wanted to check on that cervical lip. I ended up closing my legs and pushing her out of the cervical check, um, which she wasn't too happy about. Um, but I didn't care because I'd said that I was done with the cervical check and that we were just gonna continue laboring. So that was definitely something that I didn't appreciate in my labor. And one of the moments that I if I was gonna have regrets in my labor, which I don't, I came up with a beautiful bubba, um, he's healthy, and I feel like, you know, nine out of 10 for my labor is great, but this definitely was the one out of 10 spot that I wasn't super happy with. I didn't need that cervical check, um, and I felt like it really stressed me out because after the check, she sort of said, yeah, I think it's a cervical lip, you know, so we'll just see how that goes, but you know, I'm not, not too um, confident about that. And to hear that is just so difficult, um, especially since now I think back, I'm like, she doesn't actually know that I had a cervical lip and often cervical lips still dissipate as you dilate. They're not necessarily um, an indication of stalled labor or failure to dilate, you know, all these negative terms. Um, and I definitely didn't imagine myself as somebody that was gonna feel defeated by things like, you know, dilation progression and, and lips and things like that. 
but I definitely got frustrated because I'm like, I've just done two hours work on a, you know, a cervical lip. I felt like all that work had just gone out the window. Um, and I mentally felt like I can't do this forever. If I've got a cervical lip, I can't do this for another five, six hours, especially if I'm not making progress, you know? So if you know you're dilating or you know you're, you know, facing or whatever it is, or you're pushing and you can see bub, you have that motivation to continue, but the idea that I was pushing on a cervical lip, um, yeah, I found that really, really difficult and I started to get really frustrated, which is why Jay was such a good girth partner because he really tried to stay calm. Somehow he got me in the shower in my little hissy fit and things moved really quickly from there, which I'm really grateful for. So basically there's a chair in the shower Jay stood behind me and was sort of massaging my back and just making sure that I was stable. Um, I put my hands on the um, seat of the chair and so I was sort of bent over, so a little bit of a A. Um, don't ask me what angle that is, I'm not sure. That was really helpful. I don't know if it was a change in position or I actually was closer than people were sort of thinking and it was just a natural progression. But um, my body just continued to have contractions and I just felt the need to sort of feel around and see. I guess I was curious to sort of feel what it looked, felt like for myself. Um, so I put my fingers up there and I could actually feel something and I thought to myself, I don't think that's cervix, I don't think that's just vagina, like I think that's a head. And then I sort of felt again and I could feel that it was quite soft, um, which in hindsight you probably don't want to be like prodding at your baby's head because they do have their little fontanelle up there, but I didn't know that and babies are very resilient, like they're coming through that birth canal and they are getting squished, let me tell you. And just feeling my baby's head on the way was the best feeling ever because it meant that either my cervical lip was never there or it dissipated or whatever, baby's head had moved past the cervix and was in my birth canal, um, which just the best feeling ever. I was so chuffed, um, but I didn't want to create a big ruckus and get everybody all worked up. So I actually didn't tell anyone for quite a while. I reckon I labored for maybe another 15, 20 minutes in the shower, um, sort of just letting the contractions come and go. And once I knew that bub was on the way, I relaxed so much in my head. I'm thinking like, just enjoy this time as much as you can because obviously like it's still really painful, but between contractions, I just felt elated and I was really excited. Um, and then eventually I said, okay, like I can feel baby's head. Um, and they're like, okay, like we'll have a little look see or whatever. Um, and they could also feel baby's head. I, at this point was really struggling to um, pretty much hold myself up, um, which I really wanted to birth how I'd been laboring on the bed, which was on all fours um, and with my arms up sort of on the headrest part of the bed, like if the bed elevates like that. Go watch my birth vlog if that's a bad description. Um, and I just couldn't keep myself up because obviously like you're still contracting quite a bit, um, which is a little bit hard because I ended up pushing on my back. So I wasn't flat on my back, I was sort of elevated so I could like see what was happening, if that makes sense. But I just feel like laboring on your back is just, I feel like for me, it was not a good position to labor in. I didn't feel like I had too much of a choice because I just had to get the baby out. But I do wish that I had been able to labor in some kind of different position maybe. Um, so I pushed for, I think, an hour and a half or two hours, which was really long. And again, I was not expecting it to be that long. Something that I've got my birth preference as well, which I'll chat about in a second, is that I didn't want to push my baby out which I think I'd say I semi-pushed my baby out as opposed to breathing your baby out, which might sound a little bit airy-fairy, hoity-toity, but basically your, your body has an ejection reflex where your body will push that baby out. So it's not just gonna sit in your birth canal and then like you have to strain the baby out, otherwise it's just gonna stay in there forever. Um, your body will continue to push that baby out all the way until it comes out which is where you hear stories of people like accidentally just birthing in their car or in the street or on their way to hospital. So for me, I wanted to sort of wait until I felt that urge to push and breathe the baby out. Um, I definitely felt like the midwife who was back again. Um, she really wanted to direct my pushing, which is what you'll often find, you know, the one, two, three, they count to 10, that's how long you hold the push for. 
um, and then you can take a breath and you sort of try to sync that up with your contractions to sort of get the baby moving down your birth canal. I didn't actively tell her to stop counting, but what I would do is, is as I felt that contraction build up, you sort of get this like warning that the contraction is coming. I would very slowly start to engage sort of the same muscles that you use when you do a number two when you go to the bathroom. I would slowly engage that. The imagery that I had in my head was sort of putting your foot on the accelerator of a car very slowly. Um, and then as I would come out of a contraction, I would take my foot off very slowly. So there was no slamming my foot on to the accelerator, you know, foot on the gas. That was the imagery that I took in. It was just like slowly get to a point where you are like, you know, pushing, like holding that contraction and then gently come out of that. And, you know, there was quite a few times when she would say to me, like, you need to you know, be pushing harder or faster. And I just knew from the birth stories that I heard and the biology of it all is that your baby is supposed to take its time down that birth canal because your vagina needs to stretch, it needs to make way for your baby. It's not sort of just boom. The contractions are working with your vagina together and that baby needs to work its way out. And oftentimes even the head will bob in and out of the vagina entry before the head completely delivers and then the body follows. So knowing that, that it's okay for the baby to bob in and out and take its time and you know, going backwards isn't a bad thing. It, it often means that the vagina is stretching and preparing. So knowing that was really important going in. So it's been proven that straining and directed pushing, especially if it's premature and the baby's not actually fully in the birth canal, is often linked with um, really severe tearing. Um, so you obviously have different degrees of tearing and there's definitely some leeway in there where the vagina's gotta make space somehow. And sometimes the, the weakest point in your skin or your muscle will tear slightly. And that's where you'll sort of need maybe a stitch or two, or sometimes you get a little graze where um, it might bleed a little bit and there's a little bit of damage there, but um, it doesn't require stitches. That kind of thing is just gonna happen. Oftentimes directed pushing, um, which can be quite intense and aggressive and doesn't allow any time for your vagina to do its thing, will lead to quite bad tearing. And oftentimes that can lead to um, difficulty with your pelvic floor and um, you know really long time healing so that's what I was just saying in my head was like there's no rush your baby is built for this your baby's not suffocating your baby's never taken a breath before it's just lived in your amniotic fluid it's okay its head is built to be squished and to be pushed down this narrow little pathway so I understand there's definitely times when bubbers need to get up maybe their heart rate has dropped um, and there's definitely um, a sense of emergency in that. And I can completely understand that. But for me, I was thinking this has been a short labor. Baby's been doing so well, moving all the healthy things. Sorry, my battery went flat, so I've just moved it so it's closer to a PowerPoint. Jay was down the business end and I asked him, can you see baby's head getting closer and closer? And he said, and the midwife both said that they could. And every sort of push that I did, baby's head um, was definitely like making progress um, and getting closer to being birthed. So for me, that's all that I needed to know. And I just kept doing my controlled pushing, my breathing out of the baby. Um, I do wish that I had maybe taken even a little bit slower and maybe waited for a little bit more of that pushing sensation, which I was feeling, but I feel like I definitely could have waited a bit longer and um, felt that um, ejection reflex. So all in all, the pushing went well. It was long and it was hard and it was tiring, but eventually his head was out, which I've got some very interesting photos of that nobody will ever see. But it was such a good feeling to know that he was doing really well and that sort of the harder part of the pushing was done. Um, and then after that, it was probably a couple contractions later and I birthed the rest of his body. Um, Jay actually caught him and put him up onto my chest, which I thought was so beautiful because he sort of iffed and awed a little bit about that because he was nervous of dropping Coda Bear, which I think is a really valid reason to be a bit nervous. He caught him and he was amazing. Again, I've got some photos of him as I was birthing and he looks a little bit petrified. I don't think anything can prepare you for what you're gonna see. Even myself, I could see everything. I think because of the way I was sitting, I 
didn't need a mirror or anything. Like I knew what was happening down there and it was definitely interesting. He birthed really successfully and had a beautiful little cone head um, because they actually birth from the back of their head out a lot of the time, or Coda Bear did anyway. Um, and so he sort of looked a bit like an alien for a bit, which probably was a bit confusing for Jay, who um, spent a bit of time with him after that while I birthed the placenta, because I don't think we ended up getting around to watching an actual birth video because I birthed a little bit sooner than I guess we were expecting. Um, but that settled within a few hours and the next day he had the most gorgeous little tennis ball head. It was so cute. So one area that I hadn't spent too much time researching was the delivery of the placenta. And I wish I'd looked into it a little bit more, but at the same time, I don't know if it would have changed too much. Um, but basically what happened is my bladder filled up quite quickly after my birth. Um, and those after birth pains that you get, which are pretty much just contractions, that are still um, trying to birth the placenta which needs to come out with the baby. Um, we did delay cord clamping, which is where the blood um, basically leaves the umbilical cord and goes back into the baby so that the cord will be sort of white and flaccid and we cut the cord after that. So I think that might've been 10 minutes or so of him just sort of having skin to skin with me. And then after that, you sort of wait for the placenta to come out and it can take a little while, it can take you know, a little bit longer, but it's not supposed to take too long. And I think we probably left it quite a while before, um, yeah, we sort of started panicking a little bit. So what you can do is you can get a Syntocin shot, so a Synto shot, which is basically synthetic oxytocin, which is the happy hormone, the hormone that sort of gets everything going in the first place. It's sort of something that will trigger your labor and it's something that floods your body after your birth um, most of the time and it will also stimulate your boobs to start filling with milk. So they did offer that to me, but I was really happy to sort of just wait it out and see if I could do a physiological delivery instead of a managed delivery of my placenta. Not that there's anything wrong with a Syntocin shot, I just thought I would try. Um, and you know, I don't love needles or anything, but in the end I did get the shot and it didn't hurt. So it's really nothing to be afraid of, especially after you've just had this massive birth, it's the easiest part. But yeah, an hour and a half sort of went, I moved around a bit, um, sort of tried to breathe through um, the after birth pains, the contractions to sort of, you know, the placenta has to peel off the wall and then be birthed. But by then my bladder had filled up so much that it had actually put a lot of pressure on um, my now shriveled uterus um, and it was just getting in the way of my placenta delivery, um, which is quite dangerous because every single bit of your placenta needs to be delivered, otherwise you're at a high infection risk. But these days, if there's retained placenta or some sort of obstruction and you're not breaking the placenta um, quick enough um, and there's a risk of infection, they'll often take you to theatre and they will make sure that that whole placenta is removed, which is obviously quite stressful after you've just had um, your baby, which you want to spend time with your baby, you want to sort of get some skin to skin, get that feeding going, which is so amazing that we have the option to go to theatre, it's life saving, millions of babies are saved by procedures such as this or uh, women are saved by procedures such as this, including caesareans. Um, and like I said, I don't know the name of this procedure, but basically the removal of placenta, so there's no retained placenta. Um, so I feel very grateful that that was an option that I had. But basically in hypnobirthing, we learned the acronym BRAIN, which is benefits. So you always ask, okay, so you're suggesting this, maybe it's your midwife or your doctor or somebody. So an example might be, they might ask, hey, would you like a cervical check? Um, and then I might say, okay, I'm considering it, what are the benefits? We just wanna see how far along you are or how your cervix is looking. You might go, okay, so that's the benefits. I've actually decided that I'm happy with how I'm laboring, I'm in a good mental state, so I'm actually gonna say no thank you. Or you might say, I was wondering that myself, I'm happy with a cervical check, I know it's invasive and I give you consent, let's do a cervical check. So the R in brain is risk, which I think is so important because in my experience and in my opinion, a lot of the time, especially in a hospital setting, I don't think the risks are explained to you as thoroughly as they could be. Um, and the risks can be trauma related, it can just be pain, um, it can actually be dangerous. So for me, asking the risks is really important. Then next you've got A, so alternatives. And this one's great because I think sometimes you just have to find a happy medium, you know, a third option. So you might say, I don't want a cervical check, but I am happy to try a different position. The next one is I, which is instincts. Again, super important. 
you might not feel like something is quite what you want or something's a little off with the option that's been presented to you and that is super important so I remember multiple times that I used my instinct in my labor and I didn't necessarily tell people that I was doing that um, so for example when I knew that I could feel Bob's head I kept that to myself for a long time because I just felt like there was gonna be a swarm of people come in when I told them that Bob was on his way and I didn't feel like I needed that at that time. I just needed some space, so I used my instinct. The other one is N for nothing. So this one means if I do nothing right now, what will happen? And I asked that a few times. I said, okay, I see what you're saying there. If I do nothing, you know, are there risks with that? Is it okay if I do nothing? Do we need to change something? So that's been so helpful for us. And the main thing that that was helpful for was this sort of retained placenta situation. Um, so basically the midwives were really gentle. They didn't tug on the cord or anything. They sort of just had a bit of a look, um, a little bit of a feel around and basically it wasn't budging. I went to the loo, I sort of tried to um, change position. I tried to wee and nothing was coming out. So um, eventually, you know, they were a little bit panicked. Um, they did call in a doctor and an OB. So the obstetrician came in with the doctor and they sort of chatted me through like why we need to get things moving. Um, at this point, Jay was holding Coda Bear, so it was really nice to know that Coda was being looked after and um, he cried and he sort of had his little checks and he was doing really well. So I was able to sort of fully engage with the doctors. I had my gas and air on, which I'd had through my whole labor and loved. Um, and basically they just said, look, we're gonna take you into theater. I had researched sort of, um, I don't think it's actually retained placenta, that's when the placenta breaks apart, but um, I don't know, like a halted delivery of placenta, and I knew that they could palpitate um, your abdomen, your stomach area, to sort of get that placenta moving, which is quite an invasive and very painful procedure. Um, basically what the doctor would do is put their hands down and then slide um, down your stomach with a lot of pressure like their body weight behind it and just get that placenta out like there's nowhere else for it to go but to deliver um and i'm sure you can imagine after you've just had a baby everything's very swollen i had torn a little bit so it wasn't something um that i'm sure everyone's putting their hands up for but i felt like it was worth giving a go so that's where i used my brain and um i asked for alternatives and that was an alternative that i suggested and the doctor said that he was happy to give that a go and if it didn't work he said we would need to get you into theater it's, you know getting to the point where it's almost an emergency and i said if we don't have time for it let me know i'm not saying i'm not going to theater i'm not resisting but i want to know if there's other things to be done and if i hadn't said that if i didn't educate myself and come in with that awareness and then sort of keep my head about me and use my brain um, I feel like that suggestion probably never would have come up. The OB told me you might want to start sucking on that gas because this is really, really going to hurt. She put it all the way up. Um, I sort of started seeing stars and everything was a bit swirly. And then he went one, two, three. He put all of his body weight behind him and he basically just pushed my placenta out. I birthed the whole placenta. There was no retained placenta. Um, it was the best feeling ever. I was bowling my eyes out because I was getting quite panicky. I just felt physical relief as well. I felt like I'd officially birthed everything because unfortunately for us ladies, once we birth our babies, there is this whole second half of having to birth our placentas. Sometimes that goes really easily. You don't even feel it. The placenta doesn't have bones, so it's sort of supposed to just slush out. But then for some people it is quite painful and quite difficult. That was quite dramatic. That's not in my birth vlog because um, by then obviously we weren't filming. So after the placenta was delivered, um, he stitched me up. Um, so I had a small superior tear and then I had torn slightly into the muscle as well. Um, so I think I got a couple of little stitches. Um, they numb you up first obviously and things just calmed down after that. We weighed Coda Bear and we did all those sort of fun things. That was my birth story. So quickly, I will just go through my birth references. I know this is a long vlog already, but I'm hoping you guys are interested and want to hear more. So at the top of my birth references, it says, there is always time to ask questions. I only get to birth code once, you know. I wanted to, to do my best and I wanted to look back and be, you know, proud of, of whatever kind of birth I had. But ultimately, like, you only get to do this once. You know, give it your all, ask questions. And then lastly, I've got stay calm. Um, which I felt like with the placental delivery, 
I was so proud of Jay and I, because I know Jay was um, quite worried, but we stayed calm, we asked questions, um, we breathed through it, and I feel like that really got us through. And then I wrote in capitals, congratulations, we made it. Today is the day it is happening. Remember, no matter what happens, you are strong, decisive, and educated. Then I had Jessa and Jay's optimal birth will be a spontaneous vaginal delivery, including a physiological third stage with minimal pain relief or intervention. That the health and well-being of baby and mama are ultimately the main priorities and intervention, including epidural, C-section, episiotomy, forceps, and a managed third stage will be considered upon discussion with both parents, firstly with the allocated birth partner, Jay, to avoid distracting Jessa, and then Jessa where needed. Um, then I chat a little bit about how I don't want too many cervical exams, um, and that Jay is um, a really attentive birth partner, so to run things by him. So it's every mum's prerogative, uh, but I didn't want to have medical students or interns present at the birth. I knew that I would be playing a big mental game, um, and I didn't know if I could handle having people there who um, were maybe a bit distracting, so that was something that we decided to do. Basically then, I just have the heading environment and I just chat through how my optimal room would be dark, bright and calm to avoid getting overwhelmed or overstimulated. Um, the next one is chatting about intervention, which probably didn't matter too much for my actual birth because by then my waters had broken, but it was good for Jay to have. Um, so I just chatted a little bit about different interventions um, and times I'd be willing to consider that. Um, then I talk about uh, pain relief and optimal pain relief options that I was willing to consider. Um, the only thing that I basically refused to have uh, was the sterile water injections in your back. Um, for me, I've just heard so many women say that it hurt so much to get in and they didn't feel like it was worth it for the relief that they got. Um, I'm not great with needles and I just didn't feel like I could imagine myself at a stage needing that, um, especially since they don't always work. So that was the only thing that I said there's pretty much no situation where I will get them. So I think one of the most important parts of a birth preference plan is the emergency part. So I've got a little emergency section here just outlining how we would prefer to go around an emergency. Um, so it's got my blood type, um, it talks about elective C-section and how we're happy to consider a C-section um, if we've been struggling after a really long labor. Um, or if I request it, or if obviously there's an emergency. Um, but we do talk about how, um, you know, we would love for Jay to be in the room um, unless it's um, an emergency and he's not able to be. So I feel like all these things were really important um, for the midwives to read if I'm not doing well. Um, so if I'm, you know, unconscious or losing a lot of blood or hemorrhaging or even worse than that, um, just to keep Jay informed. Um, and to keep Coda Bay with Jay as much as possible um, and things like that. Then I just um, ended with saying that I would like to breastfeed if possible, but will also be attempting to pump um, and that we will not be giving him formula in the hospital. Um, Coda Bay was mixed fed um, for six and a half months, but I didn't want them giving him formula without me knowing. Um, and then I just said at the bottom, thank you for your amazing services and understanding because the medical team were amazing and what they do is so incredible. I could never, I'm not patient enough to do what they do. So I was really grateful. Then I've got my affirmations, which like I said, I probably used more before my birth. Um, but some of them are, we are making informed decisions. Each surge brings my baby closer. I trust my instincts. I am ready to give birth to my baby. My partner and I are the world's best team. I am a force to be reckoned with. All I need is within me now. Trust in your body and believe in yourself. Each wave brings me closer to my baby. Relax down and breathe slowly and open gently. So I feel like they were really motivational. So that is majority of it. Like I said, go watch the birth vlog if you'd like a visual of some of my birth. Um, but hopefully that fills in some gaps. And good luck to any mamas out there who are planning a pregnancy, are pregnant, just had a baby. 
Um, if you're still in the trying to conceive phase, I have been there and I'm thinking of you. Um, and all of us women are so incredible no matter what stage we're at. And last but not least, please subscribe if you enjoy these videos. I do a plethora of different videos now. I've still got some birth and baby vlogs coming, so if that's the kind of video you like to watch, then stay tuned because I'm not done. Hopefully, I will see you in one of those soon. Mwah.